the more I teach, decades now, <coughs> the more I realize that there is no short-term progress. In sense, it's on the short term disappointing because the efforts are great, but the results are always smaller, as if the um, cruel analogy of the sand castle on the beach um, covers that part of the um, hopeful progress that holds on through the muscular memory, through the uh, um, awareness and experience of how you handle yourself when you perform a piece, the structure, the tempo, the phrasing, the fingerings, it's like a consequence of all these choices. <clears throat> of course you play with the unknown, uh, how the instrument will respond to your fingers that you play one time at some concert hall with its advantages if it's beautiful as well as, as also often the unevennesses of the keyboard that doesn't respond according to your um, expectation in weight and for in depth and in sound quality in current in, in the case of the voicing acoustics of the acoustics uh, matter too for the tempo but you don't and you can't hope that um, the artist will switch the paradigm to to, to to adapt to the new situation in fact they play as they have prepared and then <clears throat> sometimes the acoustics, if they're very generous in resonance, they blur some things, which in a way it's lucky, um, but in, the, in, the, it's in another way it's unlucky because um, clarity is among the elocution, the quality of the bass quality that is expected from an oratorian, which is what in a way a performing artist is, regardless of the language, in this case music, because you have to be spoken, you have to be meaningful, while you have to be um, seductive and pleasant and descriptive and a storytelling that englobes the atmosphere of the storytelling. A lot of factors that um, you cannot control in real time, they control you more than you control them, and not to mention the st stage fright connected to the um, Dicta dictatorship of the wrong note as if a good interpretation is only <coughs> when it's clean and then can be discussed further about the choices the rubato the ritenuto the tempo the good or bad taste according to subjective opinions but clean playing is objective in a certain way is the lowest denominator but okay, that's what um, you do when you play in front of professionals who know the pieces or at least can read the score while you play if they don't know the pieces themselves because after all the repertoire for piano is the widest of most. And therefore with a good ear and well-trained hearing they can um, detect if you do something according to the score. Though authenticity is an overstated necessity today, <clears throat> even for the pieces of the past, which were recorded by great artists before World War II, who didn't have those editions, and frankly, authenticity wasn't their, their motivation. It was their personality filtering the emotion of the composer to their audiences, as if it's all about subjective opinions. And then the good taste is their good taste, and the bad taste is all the others. And of course, when you play in front of an audience, that you don't know who is in the audience in terms of who is informed with the piece, who is comparing it to another performer they like in this piece, or people who just sit there and don't know the piece and just want to hear you play. And then you become their um, um, cantor, their um, storyteller, uh, their thousand one night uh, storyteller you you um, bring them psychologically to to um, hold their breath when it's soft and slow and perhaps there is a rest that's like a pregnant rest of intensity uh, the all all the factors of classical as they call it I think it's just music but let's say compared to pop is that it's not an entertainment it's really a reflection based music of course you have the music that is for functions um, like church music, military music, um, dance music, accompaniment singing music, circus music, film music, computer music for commercials or video games. In other words, um, 
sort of a um, soundtrack for lives events, which today are conserved because of the recording technology since the beginning of the 20th century improved them. But before it was all to be constantly replayed and redone because it vanished as soon as made. So it was the, it's the reign of eph ephemeral facts. And um, here and there, the invention of the, or rather the um, uh, marketing of the metronome in the 1820s in Vienna by Melzel brought in some objective opinion about how many beats a minute uh, the composer um, escapes, escapes, <laughs> escapes, that's a good Freudian escape, um, expects rather um, the performers of the future to know how to play him because obviously the ones of his time can ask him. But that objectivity doesn't go into the addition because you don't know if the dynamic marking is between the two staffs. So does it really take care of the right hand or the left hand? And if it's multi-layered writing texture, string quartet-like, then it's impossible to be all just one dynamic for all the two hands um, elements that they play, which is possibly up to five with the fugues of Bach, or five voices, or even without to be a fugue. There is a capacity of complexity because of the two hands playing um, to uh, enhance the texture to the point to which it becomes unlistenable unless you voice and bring out things then totally subjectively, but it's your interpretation, it's your choice. You choose the frame, you choose the, um, the, the span and the cam, and you decide how you want the audience to listen to the piece according to what you will bring out to voice. Would it be unusual compared to others, or is it gonna be just mainstream? Regardless, but you can do creative voicing, you can do um, personalized tempi. Of course, if you are to include in interpretation the opinion that an interpretation is in fact um, a paraphrase, just like a lot Busoni did in the, um, or Rubinstein used to do, I mean the great artists of the turn of the 20th century on the piano. As I said, authenticity wasn't what they were before or around or for. Um, they were there to, um, to enhance the texts with their own virtuosity, um, sort of their signature. And, um, but then you have the, the notation of the composers left, and the elements left to undecision, like uh, grace notes, uh, unmeasured compared to measured 30 seconds and how to differentiate them, or how much does a crescendo go to crescendo before it reaches piano if it's anticlimactic? Is it just a change of color in orchestral section or is it really a psychological non-event that you almost but not get to the climax? That is not the same. And then of course, if you have a linear reading or you have a uh, multi-layered reading or you have a horizontal reading with vertical chords that here and there punctuate the statements, you um, in a way bring the uninformed listener to hear it differently, especially when you have long values and then short values in the same hand, they end up by hearing a combination of the two because they hear the moving notes and the decaying long held notes on the piano inevitably not, unless they are played louder in the get-go in order to last until the diminuendo that it becomes natural through their decay that you take in account so I can uh, exit uh, into the next series of long uh, short notes. So you, you, you plan how to organize the, um, yeah, I was gonna say bridged phrases, but it's not exactly the word, but some kind of arching of the phrase that gives the illusion ultimately that you play all flat but inside it you do some kind of um, arching and if you do too many small archings then it becomes um, chopped and unfriendly. Uh, For instance, if it's a Baroque music or early classical music, the structure of a group of bars is like the evidence. You hear it like tracks before you've even seen the train go on them, but they're there and you're just um, comfortably riding them. But uh, when you have a um, uh, 19th century romantic era, Western music that develops this very long um, <laughs> punctuate pu without punctuations at the sentences, literally even on sentences, you have to find ways to um, bridge them through the harmonic, through the breathing. Of course, the piano doesn't need to breathe like a singer, wind uh, player, or a, um, or any musician, uh, even using a bow up and down. Um, so the tempi are not related to some um, 
limitation or then by practice some amazing um, uh, development of the capacity of the breathing, exhaling the breathing to, to, to fit more notes and not have to breathe between two, cent two uh, syllables of a word. So the pianists don't have words to play. Um, they don't have breathing to respect. They can, with the pedal, the acoustics and the piano, different uh, beautiful concert grand instruments, go into some kind of totally artificial um, um, lethargic slow tempi that can enhance some, perhaps um, unnatural to my opinion, but possible um, traction of the tempo that enters in some kind of a meditational state. And why not? After all, um, there's so many pianists and the competitions make them so sound alike when the audiences want them to be individual. So they tell them their storytelling with their own passion, way, personality, and uh, therefore they take risks to be disagreeing with most whenever the, now the competitions ask for editions specifically for which edition and specifically for which edition um, reissue and all that. Uh, they put it in the rules of the competition. What's the point? So they want reciting um, um, robots or do they want um, cultivated, um, intelligent and emotional um, storytelling of the pieces that they are translating from the score, which after all is relatively incomplete in its details of in between the notes, um, to, to the audience. And what makes the conviction is probably the charisma of the performer more than the um, conception of the piece. That's more for a conference of a musicologist or a music scholar. Uh, you explain, you explain, uh, you give an example, and then um, it's a different format. When you play a concert, you just speak with your notes, and uh, most of them are not yours. They're the composer's notes, believably becoming yours, just like an actor saying lines that are not his, but so believable that you think he is the character. If not, there is no rupture of disbelief. And in my experience, because of the fact of teaching pieces where there are so many innuendos by the composer that are not surely what for sure we know it's supposed to be. What do we do? We read that some composers, take Ravel as an example, was always um, re um, referring to interpretation as betrayal. He said to Marguerite Long and her students playing of his works in a master class that they don't have to make interpretations of his music. All they have is to play the notes. As if the score gives it all. But that's not true. I beg to differ, both as a composer and a performer. I can say composers don't, uh, don't own the interpretation of their work. As a matter of fact, they probably are the ones who know it the least. Just because they gave birth to the child, it doesn't mean that the child is only understood by the parent and misunderstood by all the rest of the world in the eyes of the parent. Well, sometimes that proves to be right <laughs> in experience of life. But let's say that I got carried away in my uh, analogy and now I'm... St <laughs> Whoops. Um, well, anyway, um, I cannot back up out of that now. But I'll say still that when you meet somebody at a point or crossroads of their life at a different season of their life, you meet them with all what they have accomplished or what they have lived through or what they have um, dealt with of life's uh, um, up and down um, adventures. Uh, sometimes luck, sometimes bad luck, sometimes uh, success, sometimes uh, endless struggle. Everybody has a different way of looking at their uh, path through life from the unknown birth to the unknown death. Um, but without to become so easily philosophical, it's, it's cheap at the same time, sorry. I should have digressed away from that earlier. My point was that the more I teach, the more I realize that it's like a ship that's very slow to change direction when it's very big tanker, for instance, when they have to change the route. Um, it doesn't happen between lessons, it doesn't happen between school years, it doesn't happen at the stage of um, perhaps even 10 years. 
and it's so personal because the capacity of uh, filtering so much information with their own drive um, that shouldn't be erased um, when they study with these, these and those people um, is the individual responsibility of each teacher to be careful and aware not to extinct the flame that brought this student in the first place to want to play the piano by giving this student too much um, rules that uh, end up by perhaps affecting his or her um, expectation of themselves. Just like in composition, if you tell them everything was written before you in tonal system, there's no point to continue enriching the past. I think that's not true. And I don't think that as a composer for the interpretation, nor do I believe that as an interpreter for the pieces. Of course, in teaching, I love, I love to demonstrate how he could have gone, why didn't he go there, or what did she choose to do? Because, of course, we also play women's music, even unfortunately lesser, but it's interesting that the intuition of ours is ours. You know, the teacher, or I mean case performer, not always a teacher every day, though most of the day, uh, the evening, but at some point I play, I play without to teach, I play just to respond to the music, to, to serve the muse. And um, I grew to discover differently in pieces I've seen, played and known when I was younger, all of a sudden they reveal themselves differently to the point to which I managed to almost lose my concentration on performance because I'm so surprised by a different um, um, highlighting of the prism that all my... Uh, serene knowledge about the piece plus experience on playing the piece is sort of vanished, erased by the new way it reveals to you. As I said, most of the time when we perform, we're sort of vibrating membrane of the expression of the piece compared to uh, practicing just to solidify the technical muscular memory so we can go through the unknown of the stage, but on the stage it is the unknown. And it's true that many times the the awareness of what we do is different because there are people compared to practice room. We're going to have practice room with audience. Obviously, that's not practical. An orchestra during practicing a concerto as a sonata until you meet the orchestra at the very close to the concert and you're mostly disturbed by their presence rather than uh, used to their construction with you like uh, large chamber music, even if the solo and the orchestra are often in a romantic era and modern times more contradictory than the Mozart, Beethoven, uh, concerto grosso style, but still all this collaborative instrument playing, whoops, sorry, A for nothing, um, <laughs> just the thoughts, um, the violinists playing quartets, playing trios, playing groups in, in string orchestra, in chamber orchestra, in group orchestra, in solo, in chamber music separately, and all at the same time, they have a culture of co contributing to each other. The pianists spend their time practicing alone, and it has um, to take so much from their energy and concentration and abnegation from other pleasures of life. And the fact is, is that it's not always rewarded on stage. And then becomes the trouble because then you realize you so much want your student to play well at the concert or, or the jury or the exam or the performance there that's important for towards which they prepare. And you realize that if they don't go through the hurdles as they expect, they will feel... Um, disappointed because they'll say all that for that and when will I be able to and so that's why I was starting this conversation or rather monologue inevitably with the camera and you behind it is the fact that um, I've observed how uh, teaching is really nothing but um, um, putting grains on the soil and then the harvest happens way after the person who put the, the grains. Perhaps I should get old enough to be able to see. For few already, who, who were my students when I was young, and they were young, or younger, um, though when you're a very young teacher, the students are mostly your age. When you get older teacher, the students are younger age. But one way or the other, I don't believe it. Oh, I don't believe. I believe in the fact that I have something to bring to them from my experience, but I'm humble enough to keep in mind that it's not all about the asymmetry of the teacher, you know, diversing the knowledge on the 
on, on the student as if they were the recipient and we are the diverser. No, I think it goes both ways. In a subtle way, the student gives the student, uh, the teacher, so much food for thought through even their mistakes or misguessing of a note that sh they were persuaded as right, even if they look at it in the score in front of their eyes. Their ear, their musical intuition dictates them this, which is not the same as the intuition of the composer, obviously, or let less of the <clears throat> engraver of the score in the publishing company, who could have put in there this um, um, courtesy accidental that will avoid that misguessing. But at some point, you cannot avoid all the misguessings. You cannot avoid all the mishaps. You cannot avoid ahead of time, despite of the best advice of fingers that are solid, a certain missed note or shifting. Is it nervous? Is it um, outside of the complete control of oneself? And to which part of our subconscious can we be so um, controlling of our details? in order to play still the complete um, construction of the piece that we display ephemerally once in front of the audience, jury or whoever it is. Um, when we practice, we do it by sections and we start it again and we play it again through and by sections and again and through. Like recording sessions, some um, do more details and others do more full takes, but regardless, the end result matters. Do we, are we convinced by the gesture, the narration, the texture, the legato, or the singing capacity, or the spoken song, <coughs> or the uh, narrative song, or the narrative um, um, non-legato, the wet legato, uh, um, air legato. So many ways um, that we code with our, I guess, imagination of touches. Um, what we suggest to the orchestra that we don't have, because it's not a synthesizer, we play a piano, it sounds like a piano, no matter what. Especially the cross-strung pianos um, compared to the 18th century or the 19th centuries, early centuries, um, straight-strung early pianofortes, which had different um, color colorizations, almost like the standards of the orchestra, woodwinds, brass, and strings between the top, mid, and, and, and the bottom of the um, ranges. Uh, compared to the uh, now cross string, we, which allows for the complete range um, homogeneity of the resonance, so that you don't have stinky small thin sounds in the top and boomy basses and some kind of a awkward middle. Um, no, you have like an incredible um, unified quality beauty projecting um, timbre instrument. And um, despite of that, you have to bring out the texture of the piece. And perhaps that's why it takes so long. You visit it after a first learning, you revisit it after a second relearning or remain, rem remembering for a, another occasion, and then you start teaching on a third meeting of the piece uh, through your life, I speak, um, so like a companion of life uh, with, the, with a piece, whether it be a Beethoven sonata, a Bach partita, a Chopin ballade, or whatever. And then it goes on and on, and then at some point you record it, or perhaps you did, and you re-record it. And um, each time you're revisiting it uh, from a different point of view, the teacher, the performer, the recorder, perhaps the art of writing an article about it, or a book about it, or how to play it, or how to hear it, how to think it, how to compare it to other pieces, give some kind of context for the... <coughs> Uh, curious musicians who would like to know more about it than just reciting the notes on the score and therefore to understand the other genres that the composer wrote and from where this music really comes up from and out of. It's not just that. Um, and how the composers wrote more specifically. Um, Brahms sixes, uh, Liszt octaves, Rachmaninoff chords, Bach um, polyphony, um, um, Beethoven quartets, and all that for keyboard. But as a texture, as a thought process more than a genre imitation, after all, that's what they did originally, imitating the dancing and the singing. 
um, on the harpsichord. But when the music became abstract, like a fugue, like a sonata, it became a form, more than the uh, mood in which you still have through the motivic elements that, of course, the Romantic era composers broke down and then the um, uh, liberated from the form <laughs> and the early modern in the early 20th century liberated from the tonal system itself so at this point it was a complete implosion of everything that was the rules for at least three or four centuries in Western Europe, or largely so, in classical music writing, which didn't stop any of the composers of each of the time periods to have their own personality, because you don't confuse Mozart and Rachmaninoff when you hear them, when you're just a little more trained than just listening to nothing. But of course, uh, they all use the same system, and you can say, okay, Bach and Ravel, fine, um, of course, but once you take out the alphabet, you take out the language that is common, but then you take out the form that was giving us the GPS through the listening of the piece, we knew that was a rondo form and we knew it was a sonata form, we knew how the form, the second theme will come back. We, we felt like even if we don't know the very piece, if we hear another Schubert sonata, another Haydn sonata we didn't know, at least we have some kind of way as music lovers to decode where we are in the piece or where we're going and of course be agreeably surprised by the composer's genius unexpected choices which is so beautiful that they do and not just what is expected if not all the completion of unfinished pieces will be it and thankfully it proves us that it's not but the fact is is that when you take out the language and you take out the alphabet and you take out the form once you disinstall everything, there's nothing left except individual composers who rebuild their own music uh, ecosystems for which you have to spend half of your lifetime <coughs> to be able to decode them, <coughs> let less to play them. And then by the time you play them, who can listen to you but those who have the decoder? And to have the decoder, they have to learn. It's like playing a, a piece in each language for each composer that only is spoken by this composer. I exaggerate purposely, but it's less... It's less unsubtle than that, but in fact, compared to the common language that was incredibly adaptable and um, um, adjustable to the different taste and time periods for the tunnel system that was constantly um, um, updated and adapted to the different personalities of the composers who didn't think through the centuries they have to write atonal or aformal. Um, or somehow rewrite another order of the um, uh, tones in another order of the form. No. It seems to me like uh, the performer is stuck there between the eternal <coughs> tonal language with its customizations through the centuries and then the void where everything goes and everything sounds random even if very complex and rightfully played unless you really know the language to understand it. It's exactly like listening to a love or a philosophical poem in, in a language you don't speak. You just hear the music of the sounds but without the phonemes becoming meaning. So therefore there is no meaning in a Beethoven sonata unless you understand the tonal system and you're used to it from other pieces, from before or after as a listener today, which is lucky because of the past they knew less of their own past and we know more of their future as well as their own past because we have the time to study them and record them and stock them and then um, compare them and put them on, on the, on the, on the uh, web and everybody can access an interpretation of this, a piece of that, rarities or famous things by different people from children to dead composer pianists or pianists or anyone. It's amazing! I'm finding a very exciting I find it's a very exciting time to be a music student in order to, if your curiosity is um, thirsty, you're going to get a lot for it. Because so much is available. What you do with it, that's another question. And how you filter it, that's another question. You don't have to just trust the teacher only. You know, he or she dispenses the right tempo, the right phrasing, the right pedaling, the right voicing, the right harmonization, the right colorization, the right articulation, the right direction of the line, the right tempo that brings up the pulse in order to organize the statement, the right um, uh, rubato where and when and how much in order to be good taste according to all the teacher's opinion. Of course, tradition, going back to this and that, I have my own with Mademoiselle Boulanger, others have with others, and fine, but ultimately the performer student who will de build their own life through music, <clears throat> regardless how they will serve it, writing, playing, teaching, and performing, recording, conducting, who knows, 
they will at one point or another build all of their um, routing into the uh, knowledge of the different uh, styles of music according to what they were taught but they will inevitably pick and choose so it should keep the teachers very humble and not searching for immediate reward uh, oh I like it the way you just did it it's like I want it because that doesn't mean that they do it out of conviction they do it out of desire to please you because that's sort of the short term point of the lesson if not it's conflictual and if it's conflictual I don't I don't escape uh, conflicts I intellectually it, it's important I, I respect the, the, uh, the different opinions of the students. I give them mine and then at some point I try to not say mine prevails, but I see, try and see which one holds best. After all, um, if not, one cannot constantly consider that one has the knowledge and the others don't. One has the experience, the others don't. One has the good taste and the others don't. That's not possible. One has, one owns mixed bag of good and bad taste of stuff and we evolve even in our tastes through our life you know why didn't i play earlier the way i play now or why didn't i hear it this way and um i should have not and oh my night's record it's too late <laughs> well it doesn't matter because recordings disappear also ephemerally but less than nothing I recorded this in the past we regret we don't have those but perhaps you would have been disturbed by them after all, we have Rachmaninoff playing Skriabin played. So what, right? The music that they left us is more universal than their playing of it. Even if it's marvelous and at least inevitably authentic since it was the conceptors themselves. But I'm not convinced, as I said earlier. I think that the, in a way the converts are the best um, believers in the religion. And so I think the interpreters become the converted um, um, believers in that... Uh, in that faith of this piece, of this composer's thought process. And I like that, they, they defend it, they bring it, they fight for it, they have a conviction, and they can change that conviction with time, but at least they have a temporary conviction. And I love to see them construct that in the students, mid or long term. Thank you so much. <laughs>